Well, good morning again. If you would please turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verses 23 through 28 is where we're going to find ourselves this morning. As you're turning there, I'll give just a little bit of background about the book of Hebrews. Hebrews was written to a Jewish Christian community in Rome. And what we learn about this group of believers is that because of persecution, some of these were falling back into and turning back to Judaism. This book was written to these Jewish believers to warn them against and demonstrate the greatness of Jesus Christ. It was to warn them against turning away from Him. This book was written to show the superiority of Jesus Christ above every other thing that they could pursue and the old ways of Judaism. We don't know the author of Hebrews, and uh, you can find a lot of debate on that subject, and we're not going to deal with that this morning. So let's read in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through 28. The writer says, The former priests were many in number, because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, that is Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, he has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Himself, I'm sorry. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for your church. These are your people. I pray that you would use me to speak from your word, Lord, that be clear and concise. Thank you for this church family, Lord, and what they mean to, to me and to each other. Bless this morning, I pray in your name. Amen. So the writer of Hebrews makes a distinction here in Hebrews 7, 23 through 28, makes a distinction between the priests of the Old Testament and Jesus, the great high priest. See, in the Old Testament, the, the priest would offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. God would come for judgment, and the high priest would stand in the gap offering sacrifices for sin so that God's wrath would be satisfied. Blood sacrifices satisfied the punishment for sin and showed people of the Old Testament the seriousness of sin. We see throughout the Bible that God takes sin very seriously. We were talking about that in Sunday school this morning. In the Old Testament, it was very evident to the people that God took sin seriously because they saw animal, animals being sacrificed for their sins. They saw blood being spilt on a regular basis. However, the Old Covenant in the Old Testament could not save. It merely provided a way for God's judgment for sin to be temporarily satisfied. It, dem it demonstrated God's forbearing nature and brought conviction of sin but it couldn't and doesn't save. God brought about the new covenant through Jesus. And what the writer of Hebrews is doing here is showing how the new covenant through Jesus Christ is superior to the old covenant that the Jews were stuck in, that they remained in. 
And I think we need to get some context of who this was written to so that we can have a better understanding of how it was meant to be read. We, we must remember how this would have come across to the Jewish believers who had spent their whole lives observing the sacrifices and going through the high priest and the other priests. In the verse prior to the one we started in, if you look at verse 22, it refers to Jesus as the guarantor of a better covenant. Think about how that would have come across to the Jewish people. A better covenant? How, how could it be better? This was something that we grew up in. This is our culture. And you're saying that something new has come along that's better? Sometimes it's hard to see something new as better, isn't it? And so if you read this from the perspective of those Jewish believers, you'll see the shock factor that this would have been to them. A better covenant? How could this be better? My sermon this morning is entitled, The Perfect Priest. And from this text, verses 23 through 28, I would like to show four unique things about Jesus that demonstrate his perfection and his ability to be that perfect priest for us. The first we're going to find in verses 23 through 25, it's his eternality. That is his ability to be eternal. Let's read that again very quickly. Verse 23, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, that is Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Right off the bat, that phrase, the former priests were many in number. The many in number phrase points to man's weakness. Each of us have an expiration date set on our lives here on earth. The priest could not start the work and he could not finish the work. He was just a temporary placeholder in God's eternal plan. But Jesus and his eternal nature, the fact that he remains, means that he is the beginning, middle, and end of God's plan. His eternality means that he will finish his work. He is able to see his work through because he remains. Verse 24, he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. The Old Testament priests could not finish the work because they did not continue forever. That's the distinction that this writer is making here. His eternality means that we are completely secure. Completely secure. If we served a high priest or went to a high priest as an intercessor between us and God who didn't remain forever, there's no way that our salvation could be secure. Because the high priest would, would perish, would die. That's what we see from the priests in the Old Testament. And so his eternality means that we are completely secure. It also means that there is no one else besides him. There was no one before him. There is no one now. There is not another one coming other than Jesus Christ, our high priest. His eternality means that he has beaten sin and death. We think back to Romans 6, 9. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. So our priest has beaten sin and death. And also his eternality means that he will reign forever. And he will never change. Hebrews 13, 8 Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The fact that he remains forever means that he will never give up his status as our high priest. His status remains because he remains. 
His eternality points to his ability to make continual intercession. Look there in verse 25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He's always going to be there making intercession for us because he remains. His eternal nature. That phrase at the beginning of verse 25, it says, save to the uttermost. That means to save completely. And I think I do need to point out that that does not mean that there is a, a chance that we could somehow be halfway saved or that we could miss out if we are saved. This means to his glory that our salvation rests on the shoulders of the Son of David, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ. This means that he will be faithful to see us through because of his eternality. Let me read from Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. You don't need to turn there. This is a familiar text that we read around Christmas time. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with righteousness and with justice from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So our high priest continues forever and he will see his work through. If we think back to the Old Testament and think about Moses. We know that Moses took the children of Israel out of Egypt, led them through the desert towards the promised land. But what happened when they got close to the promised land? Moses had sinned. And so he was not allowed to go into the promised land or to take his people into the promised land. If we were to draw a parallel this morning we could determine that Jesus is a better Moses because he drew his people out of sin and death and will see them through to their eternal promised land to be with him for eternity. He is the perfect priest because he remains, because of his eternal nature. He is also the perfect priest because of his character. Let's look at verse 26. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. His character means that he has satisfied God's righteous demands for a perfect sacrifice. That's what God demanded in the Old Testament. Leviticus 9, 1 and 2, we get a picture of this. It says, on the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. He said to Aaron, take for yourself a bull calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. You see, Jesus could be that sacrifice. He could be our high priest because of his character, because of who he is, because he is without blemish, because he is without sin. 1 John 3, 5, you know that he, Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So Jesus could be that priest for us because of his character. This also means that we have the ultimate example in our Savior. Hebrews 4, 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. It means he can sympathize with us. He knows the temptations and the things that we're going through, yet he walked this earth without sin, and he calls us. His character means that he didn't have to sacrifice for his sin, only for ours. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That first 
phrase of verse 26 here in Hebrews 7 says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. I think it's important to point out that this doesn't mean that we deserve such a high priest. This means that Jesus is the high priest that we need, that we desperately need. All the deficiencies of the old covenant priests, they had been rectified and made right in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the perfect priest because he himself is perfect. And this, this passage gives us a list of his character qualities of our perfect priest and tells us that he is, one, says he is holy. He is holy without blemish, without fault, without sin, completely holy. It says he is innocent. There's no fault in him. And we saw that when we read about his crucifixion and the time leading up to his crucifixion. Pilate put him on trial and finally said, I can't find anything wrong with this man. I can find no fault in him. And then when he's having that conversation on the cross with the two thieves on either side of him, the one said, we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then after Jesus died, the centurion there at the foot of the cross looking up says he praised God and said, surely this man was innocent. He's innocent. He goes on to say that he is unstained, undefiled. He's pure. There's no wrong, no sin in him. It says he is separated from sinners. And I think that is so interesting because as we know from reading the scriptures and in the gospels that Jesus did not keep himself physically apart from sinners. That's where he went. He went to those who needed him most. He was even called the friend of sinners. But this is pointing out that it, Jesus is unique in that while being with sinners, he could be with sinners without being affected by sin. Jesus separated from sin and from sinners. Then it said, he is exalted above the heavens. This speaks to his divinity. He was exalted not to the heavens, but above the heavens because he rules over all. The priests of the old covenant could never be that sacrificial lamb because they themselves were sinners. We see that his eternal nature shows his ability to be the perfect priest. His character shows the ability to be the perfect priest. And his sacrifice shows his ability to be the perfect priest. His sacrifice. Verse 27 with me. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all, when he offered up himself. Once for all, because he offered up himself. I thought back to a, a, a time I was on a, on a trip in Tanzania, and we were in this town called Arusha. And uh, we were going with a, a group of pastors there out for evangelism. And we went to this one, uh, this market, and it turned out to be a meat market. And so over in one corner, there was a pen with, with dozens and dozens of goats. And right over here was the slaughterhouse where the goats were headed. And it, so the goats over here were looking across and seeing the slaughterhouse. I think they knew exactly what was coming. And so when someone would go take one of the goats, they would take it to the slaughterhouse. Oh, that goat would just, just make a fit because they knew exactly what was coming for them. It was very sad. Uh, but, but while I was there, I was, I, I was thinking that this was a similar picture to what would happen in the Old Testament and in the, in the Old Covenant. There's a, there a place, imagine this picture in the Old Testament, the time for the sacrifice would come. The priest would walk to where the animals would be, were kept, select the lamb for the sacrifice, taking it, 
kicking and bleeding towards the altar. Its blood would flow down around the altar as the fire was kindled. And thinking about that sacrifice, a lamb being unwilling and imperfect could not fully atone for sins. When Jesus came, he sat in the garden of Gethsemane and cried out to his father, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. So we move from the Old Testament and the unwilling, imperfect sacrifice to the New Testament where we find a willing, perfect sacrifice in Jesus Christ. Fully God and fully man, his sacrifice alone could atone for all mankind's sins. He didn't need to daily offer sacrifices. His blood covered all. He did this once for all. Daily sacrifices meant that the work was never finished. It meant that the work was never finished. But when Jesus offered himself up on that cross, he cried out as he breathed his last, it is finished. It is done. And that statement rang throughout eternity to mean that God's wrath had been poured out on his holy son. That sacrifice was enough. His sacrifice was enough. The priests offered sacrifices and spilt blood that wasn't theirs. They sacrificed something something else so that the necessity of blood could be satisfied. When Jesus came, he offered his own blood, offering his own perfect self. His sacrifice points to his ability to be that perfect priest. And fourth, we find that his identity points to his ability to be the perfect priest. Look in verse 28. For the law appoints men in their weaknesses as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. The writer stresses again how Jesus is superior to the Old Testament priests, and in this case, it's because of who he is. It says the word of the oath, the new covenant, takes precedent over the word of the law because it came later than the law. It says this oath appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. His eternality, his character, his sacrifice, it's all wrapped up in who he is as the Son of God. A son dearly loved by the Father at home in heaven was that perfect, sacrificial lamb that ultimately took the wrath of God upon sin. He was able to bear that punishment and rise victorious because of who he is. Think back to me. Think back with me. The Old Testament, the book of Genesis, we read about Abraham and Sarah. Read about how they were so old and God came to them in the form of an angel, told them that they would bear a child. They were, Abraham was 100 years old. His wife Sarah was 90 years old. She laughed at that. How could I bear a child? And about a year later, she conceived and bore a son. They named him Isaac. And when Isaac was a young boy, God came to Abraham and said, take Isaac, your only son, the one that you love, and take him to the mountains of Moriah and offer him up there as a sacrifice, as a burnt offering. So We see Abraham obeying God and takes Isaac to that mountain. They leave their servants at the base of the mountain. Isaac says to his father, where's the the sacrifice? Abraham says to him, God will provide. God will provide the sacrifice. So they climb the mountain and get to the top and prepare the altar. And Abraham then binds his only son, the son that he loved, on the altar, places him there, takes his knife, ready to sacrifice his only son, and an angel stops him. It says, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God seeing you have not withhold your son, your only son, from me. So we see this picture of Abraham looking to the side and seeing a ram there caught in the thicket. He was right in what he told Isaac. God would provide. He takes that ram and sacrifices it to the Lord instead of his son. In that case, God provided. 
So we fast forward hundreds of years, and the sacrifice that God chooses to satisfy the wrath and take the burden of sin was the sacrifice of his only son. Abraham's promise to his son Isaac throughout the ages, it echoes throughout the ages, is true today. God will provide, and God did provide in the person of Jesus Christ. A son, because no other sacrifice would do, a son because of his eternal nature, a son because of his sacrifice, a son because of his identity. Jesus was and he is the perfect sacrifice. What is so key for me and for you to understand this morning is that his sacrifice has been offered on your behalf and the next step is yours this morning. Are you covered by that blood that he shed on your behalf? Do you count yourselves among those who have trusted in his name for salvation and forgiveness of sins? He is able to offer that salvation to us because of who he is and because of what he did. He is the bridge to God. He is the only way to God. He himself said it. John 14, 6 said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He is the only way. So I ask, is he pulling on your heart this morning? Have you been convicted of your sin and need for a Savior? He is the only way. He is the only one. I'd love to talk to you about that in the front this morning during the invitation time. I beg you, don't think I'm going to put this off to next week or tomorrow. The time is now. Is Jesus calling you today? If God is speaking to your heart this morning, you need to respond immediately. He deserves our attention this morning. This morning, if you're looking for a church home or a place to belong, come meet me at the front and we'll visit about that. Franklin will be the place for you to call home to serve and grow as a Christian. And if you have already trusted and and put your faith in Jesus Christ, but haven't been baptized, haven't participated in believer's baptism, come to the front. We'll talk about that too. We baptized seven last, last Sunday and we are scheduling another Big Sunday for October 21st. and would love to include you there. Whatever God is speaking to your heart, you come during the invitation time. I'm going to pray and ask Ron and, and Pam to come to the front, please. Father, we are grateful for your word. Thank you, Father, for the sacrifice that you shed on our behalf. Thank you that you are the perfect priest, Lord, that no other priest would do. Thank you that you are the perfect sacrifice no other sacrifice would do. Thank you for who you are. Lord, I pray during this invitation time that you would speak to hearts clearly. Lord, and people would respond. We love you and we thank you in your name. Amen. Won't you stand this morning as we sing?